Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, 2020 Vision, the Year Ahead in the Aerospace Sector. In an effort to minimize background noise, we have muted all phone lines. As always, we encourage questions and comments throughout the presentation using the chat box located on the left-hand side of your screen. This applies to any technical assistance you may need, as well as submitting questions which will be answered at the end if time permits. All of today's participants will receive a link to the recording of today's event within 10 business days. Lastly, we ask you to participate in a brief survey following the web conference. We appreciate feedback and suggestions to improve our, our future conferences. Today's webinar will be led by Brendan Hill. Brendan has been in aviation and engineering for 40 years, including 26 years as a British Army officer and aircraft engineer. Brendan has been in the business of assurance and certification for 10 years, four of with, which with BSI, where he's developed BSI services for aerospace. Brennan has also worked in the industry as a group quality manager for three factories, two of which were CNC manufacturing, which supplied aerospace, as well as other sectors such as oil and gas, and one of which producing manufacturing software. And now let me turn it over to our speaker, Brendan Hill. Thank you for the introduction, and good morning, good afternoon to everybody, depending on where you're listening. Um, we're going to cover quite a range of things today. Now, because our sector is so broad, I can't cover everything, uh, but I think even the sections I don't cover directly, there will be a read across to those from the areas I do cover. So there's a great deal going on in aerospace at the moment. We've got new technology in batteries and electrical power, autonomy, AI. We've got the fallout from sad recent uh, aircraft accidents and the effects on regulators, and nobody quite knows where that's going to go. And we've got urban mobility and the blurring of sector boundaries potentially between automotive and aerospace. So there's a great deal going on and hopefully the things that we cover today uh, will stimulate thought and be of interest to you. So we're going to start off looking at commercial aircraft market, then look at mobility, electrification, standards, and then a summary at the end. So there's quite a lot of detail in some of this. now. Some of it I know you'll be aware of, so uh, bear with me for the bits that uh, you're familiar with, but as I've tried to cover a broad range. So let's kick off with commercial market. Whichever way you look at this, whichever metric you choose, there's massive growth. We've got, we could measure it by RPK, by load factor, by airport movements, airport connections, revenue, routes, whatever you care to use as a metric. There's a very strong business case. Um, and there is a distinct shift as well in that things are moving to the east, whereas currently the US is the biggest market. There is a definite shift over the next 5, 10, 15 years towards the Asia Pacific region, China in particular. Um, there's a lot of this being driven by um, changes in the social background, social media images of beautiful and exotic locations driving more and more people to get out into the world and see them firsthand. Uh, and we've got an increase in the middle class in the emerging economies uh, and the, uh, the number of people that are uh, classified as uh, middle class is growing significantly. So in the year 2000, it was about 900 million. In 2018, it was uh, 2.7 billion. So that's quite a significant in, uh, number of people growing into that uh, into that class, accession into middle classes. And of course, we've got growing urbanization. Uh, in 2000, it was about 47%, and now we're looking at 55%, and that is going to continue. So you look at those together, more money, more urbanization, more desire to travel, uh, then uh, we are in a good industry, frankly. It's a good in industry to be in. <laughs> None of us is going to find ourselves unemployed. There's a lot going on. The strongest growth in Asia, as I say, uh, due to the uh, middle class succession and demography. Um, there are some restraints, however, some things which might affect it. Um, to pick a few, the International Maritime Organization is now requiring ships to have better fuel emissions, so by having better fuel. So that may drive up fuel costs, for example. So that might have a little uh, short term effect on, on the growth. And there are global tensions, which I'm sure most of you are aware of, and these could affect um, inflation, and that, of course, would affect the spending power of uh, the travelers. 
but also potentially affects the way that materials are bought and exchanged around the world. So there are some of those factors which could impact on the growth. Just as an example of how fuel can affect things, this is uh, WTI, which is West Texas Intermediates. It's a light crude, but it's used as a benchmark for oil pricing. And this is just to show the correlation or the mirrored correlation between uh, fuel prices and uh, EBIT. So it shows that a change in the fuel price can have a significant effect on the EBIT. And of course, EBIT affects our ability to invest and to grow, purchase uh, airframes, train people, and so on. So that uh, international maritime organization uh, change could have an effect on us. And of course, the sources of oil around the world are in countries which are perhaps not the most stable. So uh, we all saw that fairly recently there were some drones that bombed uh, a major refining area, and that reduced the output of that country by some 20%. So all of these things, which are perhaps unpredictable, could also affect the growth. Now, this information has come from uh, Airbus with their global forecast. <clears throat> and it shows that traffic is doubling roughly every 15 years. So that growth curve is going up, and uh, uh, it, it's pretty much exponential. So it shows that the amount of traffic for aerospace is growing. And the leading area is PRC, Public, uh, uh, People's Republic of China and India, they both have significant growth in domestic air travel, driven by government policy and increasing population. And Asia-Pac, or uh, PRC rather, People's Republic of China, they've also got um, the New Silk Road project, which is aiming to increase uh, the amount of travel and the amount of uh, commercial traffic around the world. So there's a lot going on in Asia-Pac. So APC, Asia-Pac will lead the world traffic, increasing threefold by about 2037. So that growth that we're looking at is going to continue. So every 15 years, you can say that the amount of uh, commercial aircraft is pretty much going to double. And this slide illustrates some of the key routes. These are, these are routes, sub-Saharan Africa to People's Republic of China Sea. You can see that these are the areas that are growing. It indicates where those routes are. And the key thing to note, I think, is how frequently PRC uh, appears in that table. So there's a great deal of increase in routes that uh, People's Republic of China is opening up. So China's building many airports. They're looking at uh, building something like 450 over the next few years. That's a huge number of airports. Uh, and places like Chengdu plan to become a hub. They want to build a huge runway, uh, a huge uh, airport with six runways, which is due to be operational in 2021, so it's not that far away. Uh, so with uh, the internal increase in the number of airports and their New Silk Road project, the correct name for which is the Belt and Road Initiative, which uh, shows China investing in 152 countries, uh, there's a lot of increase in travel in the Asia-Pac area. And that, of course, is linking to as you can see there, India, Africa, Middle East, and so on. So there's a great deal of growth in that region. So there is a shift from west to east in the overall focus of the market. So we've got continued growth in the global aircraft fleets. Um, Airbus and Boeing both have large order backlogs, and so they're continuing to try to ramp up production. And of course, this requires that the supply chain step up as well. And in many ways, the supply chain is the limiting factor. As you can see there, something like 42% of the deliveries over the next uh, 10, 15 years are likely to be in Asia pack with Europe and North America about 35. And uh, we're going to need something like 37,500 new airframes by 2037. But those pinch points are becoming critical. I'm sure most of you are aware that over the last few years, delays in aircraft deliveries have usually been down to engines. But interestingly, other pinch points include seats and, interestingly, toilets. I don't think anybody wants to go on a 40-hour flight without the, uh, the essential little boys' room. So those things are pinch points which can restrict 
their deliveries. And so all the primes are working very hard with their supply chains, not just on those factors, but on all the systems and components that they need to try and make sure they can meet the capacity. Because capacity is one of those things which directly affects airlines. And some of the airlines have been complaining over the last year or so that they put the orders in, they plan their fleet capacities on uh, anticipated deliveries. And then when deliveries are late, it affects the airlines directly. They're not able to start the new routes or to uh, carry the traffic they planned. And that could affect their cash flow quite significantly. Uh, and indeed, it's noticeable that um, several airlines have been affected. BA has expressed its frustration with the airframe's inability to meet orders. Scandinavian budget carrier Primera Air blamed the late deliveries for damage to its business. And indeed, it went bust this month. So these late deliveries can have significant consequences for some of the airlines. Uh, in terms of delivery, Airbus is looking at delivering, the latest figures I had is something like 880 airframes in 2019, um, which they'll probably achieve, but only if we include the A220s. Um, if you took the A20, A220s out of the equation, they'd probably be behind their drag curve. Um, part of the things affecting their deliveries was that Rolls-Royce reduced the engine deliveries uh, for the A330neos by 9%. Uh, and that held up the deliveries of the A330s. Um, Airbus has uh, some complete A380s and 330s for previous orders effectively in stock, which is interesting. And they're in talks with customers to, to get those out. They're obviously having some uh, price negotiations there. And of course, the inventory weighs on Airbus's cash flow. And Airbus is already also having to deal with the A400M, the military uh, uh, transport aircraft. <clears throat> which is apparently unprofitable at the moment. So they're in talks with their customers to renegotiate some of the contracts. I noticed that they've recently been doing um, uh, trials with parachute drops, and uh, those have gone successfully. So that might help them somewhat in that side of things. So pinch points on deliveries then, uh, and reliability issues, which had affected Quite a few of the engine manufacturers, Rolls-Royce with the Trent 1000 turbine blades, CFM 56 have had a blade failure, and the Leap 1A and 1B have had coking problems in the fuel nozzles, and the GE uh, engines, they were delayed, affecting the 777X program. So all these late deliveries of critical components can affect not only deliveries of aircraft, but also development programs as well. And part of the problem with the engines is that we're running at the edge of technological capability. There's an incessant drive for efficiency, reduction in weight, more efficiency, fuel burn in a highly competitive environment because airlines want efficiency. They want low cost to run, low cost to buy. They want low fuel burn, partly because that is, uh, uh, affects their public perception. Uh, the, uh, the environment is high profile at the moment. So running at high technology, technological limits means that there are associated with that. So it's interesting to see how those risks are being managed. Uh, and another pinch point, interestingly, is pilots, particularly affecting the, the business jets. So business jets, which are below the 2 million threshold, shall we say, um, it's becoming less economical for the operators or owners to have full-time pilots. So having pilots online or available is becoming a problem. The business jet market says that it needs something like 94,000 new pilots. But a of course, commercial, they are looking for hundreds of new pilots. And they are pinching the uh, pilots from the business jet side of things. So people is also a uh, factor that might be a restraint on not so much the commercial side of things, but perhaps the business jet world. And then we come on to some of the issues, the delivery backlogs. And uh, I have to mention this, of course, the issues from the 737 MAX. Uh, Boeing is still making 42 airframes a month and, and have 250 aircraft awaiting modification and delivery once the issues are resolved. Uh, and then they plan to deliver something like 70 a month which will be a mix of stock and new build. So in the meantime, the airlines are dealing with 
changes and challenges to their fleet planning. But with production continuing and delivery stopped, there are clear risks to cash flow, but also to customer, uh, by which I mean airlines and lessers, customer confidence and indeed passenger confidence. I'm sure we've all seen things in the news about uh, uh, perceptions of, uh, of the aircraft. And then there are the legal sides, pay, payouts to passengers, families, and to operators who have sustained losses. And I read recently that um, Southwest Airlines Pilots Association is also suing Boeing for the loss of uh, 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 hours for something like 10,000 aircrews. So there are quite a few issues which are falling out of that. Uh, and Boeing themselves have suffered a bit with the uh, uh, shares dropping. Shares dropped something like 7% on the 18th of October and then a further 5% on the following Monday after text messages from the pilots became public about uh, their previously highlighted concerns about the MCAS system, although Boeing say that that was to do with the uh, software for the simulator rather than the MCAS software itself. But it does show the sensitivity of anything to do with these investigations. So airlines are exposed to gaps in the fleets and schedules, uh, and some, like Southwest, are particularly impacted because it's an all-737 airline. It's the top 737 MAX customer with 34 in the fleet and 41 that they expected in 2019. So the timeline for the 737 MAX getting approval from the FAA will become significant. And then the question is the acceptance or not of the FAA's certification by other um, national bodies, for example, EASA, the European Aviation Safety Agency, has said that it will not accept the FAA's decision. So the FAA's approval would allow operators to work within U.S. airspace, but until the overseas equivalents give a similar approval, then operations overseas are hampered. So there's a lot of hurdles that uh, Boeing has to overcome before all the operators can have those aircraft operating in the way they hoped. And of course, Wall Street has been rather critical of Boeing. Um, and uh, there's quite a few articles uh, on uh, Wall Street's view of things. Uh, Wall Street's journal has been speculating less on the financial health of Boeing, particularly cash flow, uh, so much as whether Boeing has learned, and I quote here, whether Boeing has learned from the debacle referring to the survey taken during the past, which said that staff felt they were under pressure. And again, that's in quotations. That's not my words, it's theirs. So the focus for the Wall Street Journal is more on leadership and culture within Boeing and how that then leads on to the cash flow. So there's a bit of a, bit of a mountain to climb there for, uh, for Boeing to get uh, back into the good books. Now, the company has unveiled some changes, including supervisory powers for engineers and the reporting chain for the engineers. Um, and they are looking at swinging the pendulum back from, and again I quote here, swinging the pendulum back from the bean counters in Chicago to the engineers in Seattle. And that's a quote from the Wall Street Journal. So this is the, the public perception, the financial markets and investors' perception of where we are. Uh, and, and just as an aside, perhaps it's worth looking back at history. And I'm going to refer to um, a chap called Stanley Hooker. I don't know if many of you have heard of him. He was a famous British engineer. Stanley Hooker was the chap who was responsible for um, the Merlin engine, which powered the Spitfire, the Lancaster, and various other aircraft in the Second World War. And he doubled its power from 1,000 horsepower to 2,000 horsepower. And then after the war, he became the lead engineer for gas turbines. So he was responsible for working, uh, developing Rolls-Royce gas turbines, Bristol gas turbines. And he once said when talking about engine development projects that the questions that used to be asked when developing a, uh, an engine was, what will it do? What will be its output? How long is it going to take to draw it? How long do we take to make the first engine? How long are we going to take to test it? When can we produce it? And the last question would be, how much will it cost? And he said, and there's a video of this from the 1950s, he said that that completely turned on its head. The first question became, how much will it cost? So the focus there was on 
not how good is the machine, how good is it, uh, how much is it going to cost. And there are other examples that I would invite you to look at, talking particularly about uh, leadership and how that can affect an organization. There is a, an investigation of the 2006 crash of the Royal Air Force Nimrod. And it was investigated by a chap called Haddon Cave, which is H-A-D-D-O-N hyphen Cave, should you want to look it up. And that report uh, is worth reading because that talks about uh, leadership being at the core, being at the heart of all the things that led to the crash of that aircraft. So a bit of an aside, but what I'm getting round to is cultural issues, leadership issues, the focus being on on the finances rather than the engineering can have effects. And there are things to learn from history. I'm not implying anything, of course, by that. I'm just saying that history has lessons which perhaps we can all look at and learn. So will the other manufacturers look at the issues that Boeing has faced and reflect on them? I suspect they shall. So we may see other things coming out of that. And of course, I'm sure that the other regulatory bodies, the overseas equivalents of the FAA, will do similar. Uh, the FAA has been uh, facing challenges with it, its uh, capacity, its, its knowledge and its ability to look into and understand and hence approve these systems. Uh, and this is part of the issue about the separation between regulators and industry. There is a lot to learn from uh, these sad events and it will be interesting to watch how it pans out in the future. So on to other things then, the 777X, uh, the flight test was due late 2019, early 2020 with deliveries in late 2020. Um, that may be a bit too close as they've had some delays with the availability of the engines, uh, but I would expect that to be, um, if not delivered in 2020, then perhaps in early 2021. So. Some of the airlines, Qatar and Emirates, for example, are assuming deliveries will start in 2021. Then there's the question about the 797 and the 767. Uh, the new head of commercial, Stan Deal, is going to have to make some decisions there on whether they press on with these uh, other aircraft. The 767, they have a decision to make. Do they re-engineer the existing aircraft, much as they did with the 737, or do they go for an all-new build? So Boeing has a lot of uh, questions to look at and how it's going to um, formulate its fleet to meet the various requirements of the operators over the next few years. And then we look at the Chinese. They have the C919 coming out. Um, in China, of course, the indigenous airlines are more likely to order the C919 and later on the C929. Um, and they have something like uh, 815 orders from 28 customers at the moment. But most of these are MOUs and LOIs rather than firm orders. But that's still a fairly large population. <clears throat> and of course, that's a competitor. The C919 is a competitor with 737s, A320s and the like. So there are going to be some changes in the, the most growing area, APAC and China in particular, the biggest market, is, is coming into, into the equation over the next few years. So airlines are going to have lots of choices to make, which aircraft to buy. Then we have the geopolitical issues. There's lots going on here, and again, I've tried to summarize some of them. <coughs> First of all, Turkey, uh, the, with the uh, Syria incursion, with Turkey uh, pushing the Kurds out to uh, build a safety barrier, as they've called it, that had an effect on trade with the US, and in particular, the F-35 was withdrawn. How that's going to pan out into the commercial side of things, I don't know. But I know that Turkey is looking at growing its indigenous aircraft industry. There's a lot of investment there, and indeed government pressure to have a more complete indigenous industry for fixed wing and rotary wing and military. So there'll be some significant changes there. Moving on to China and the USA, there's the tariff situation. I can't, I can't guess how that's going to pan out, um, but I know that uh, Boeing hopes that the uh, situation will be resolved because it's affected 787 production. They've had to reduce the production because of the lack of orders from China for the 787. 
uh, talking to the 787, um, they're looking at um, changing or reviewing the global supply chains uh, because the 787 was something like 70% outsourced to reduce costs. But this has caused issues with the supply chain. So talking about newer airframes like the 777X, Boeing, I'm sure, is looking at how much to outsource and how much to bring in-house. So there may be some changes afoot with how they manage that and therefore how diverse or otherwise their supply chain is for future aircraft, managing risk versus cost or supply chain risk versus cost. I've not mentioned Brexit yet. I hate to mention Brexit, but we don't know where we're going there. Uh, for those of you that follow the news, the UK is going to have a general election in December, and uh, depending on who wins, will dictate whether we leave the European Union or not. So that could affect the UK industry, um, because uh, Airbus wings, for example, are built in the UK. Uh, we have a lot of engines built in the UK. So um, there are some questions there, but uh, far be it from me to second guess what the British electorate is going to do. But my guess, if I had to, if I had to put my money in the table, would be that the Tories will win, the Conservatives will win, and that there will be a Brexit, um, as per Boris Johnson's plan, sometime in the early part of 2020. So how that will affect trade in aircraft parts and engines. Uh, from the UK and Europe, I suspect it won't have a great deal of uh, effect because all those organizations will have uh, aimed off and planned for it. Uh, if we look at India uh, and other countries indeed, there's a relaxation of government controls to increase the routes. So India, for example, has added 128 routes uh, internally and uh, they are trying to increase the amount of indigenous aerospace industry. They're trying to get MRO work. Uh, they've built their own uh, aircraft, uh, a small uh, military trainer. Uh, HAL have built that, but it's um, some 30 years in the gestation. So it's had a rather long uh, growth period, and that is affecting uh, future bids for aircraft or military aircraft to be built in India. India wanted to buy, I think, something like 150 fighters, uh, but they couldn't come to an agreement uh, about how much was going to be built in India and how much was going to be built outside. And for the work that was done in India, who would carry the liability, the quality requirements and qu or quality responsibilities for the aircraft built in India? So while they want to grow, uh, potentially there are negotiating issues around uh, sharing of workloads and sharing of responsibilities. Uh, the China Belt and Road Initiative, the New Silk Road that I mentioned earlier on, uh, there's a lot of work going on there, 152 countries, 450 internal airports. And there are other government initiatives in low labor cost countries, such as Thailand, where they are setting up uh, low or zero tax regions to encourage growth and investment. They want companies to invest there to uh, make aircraft parts, to carry out MRO and so on. And with the shift to the east, arguably they're well placed geographically to capitalize on that. MRO. So, MRO is an area of growth, obviously more aircraft, more MRO. So I'd expect to see more, just more mergers and acquisitions because acquisitions can bring investment. Uh, and if that's well done, then it can drive down costs and maintain safety and effectiveness. Uh, things going on in MRO, though, is the, the airlines in particular are looking to MROs to really capitalize on, on digital technology, aerospace 4.0. They've seen big changes in the manufacturers in the way they're digitizing their production, digitizing their design. Uh, and so the airlines are looking to see similar benefits from the MROs. So I'd expect to see over the next year or two, the MROs really hitting the aerospace 4.0, the digital technology, the 5G and so on, to start looking at how they can improve efficiencies, how they can do, uh, how can they use the data that's available to um, have more on-wing time for engines, more air time for components, 
and less downtime. And all this, of course, is cost. So I'd expect to see those changes in MROs over the next year or two. And if we look at the technological challenge, uh, if we look at the environment in particular, aviation is 2% of global man-made CO2 emissions. But as we said, you're looking at a, fifth, uh, a doubling of, uh, of the population every, every 15 years. So that is not going to be allowed to continue. So IATA has got its CORSIA system, the uh, Carbon Offset and Reduction Scheme for Aviation. So even though there's been lots of changes, lots of efficiencies, reductions in NOx and noise and CO2 over the last 50 years, the current situation is that we need to halve that again. So that is going to keep pushing us forward. And then we move into Industry 4.0, the digitization of the world. It's the digital age. So in, in the past, computing was the next step. But now we've gone beyond that. And this is connectivity between computers, connecting computers and digitizing all aspects of the industry. So uh, IoT, design, production, maintenance, using that data to really drive improvements, reduce costs, reduce lead time, inventory, scrap, waste, material spend, overtime. Improve supply chain planning, improve the uh, order fill, the on-time delivery. So it's done through connectivity, configurability, intelligence, and security. And security is a very important thing there. Using Airbus as an example, and it's just because uh, I saw a presentation of theirs at the IQG conference recently. They're creating a data lake to gather all this data. Uh, and they have a system called Skywise, which is the point of access for operators. And you'll note in there that it includes MROs. So the desire of uh, airlines to have MROs using the digital world to drive down costs, to drive up availability, is becoming uh, the way ahead. That, that's coming to fruition. Uh, and of course, Boeing have a similar thing. They focused on its supply chain, for example, with RFIDs in their parts, as an example. So um, they get 3 million parts arriving every day. So keeping on top of their 5,400 odd supplies is a challenge. That digitization is being brought in by the primes, by Boeing, by Airbus, and all the others. And then there's robotization of the production lines, and then using things like virtual reality in training. So this technology is going to advance. Every aspect of what we do in the industry is going to advance and accelerate, even down to auditing using virtual reality and information technology for conducting remote audits. So those of you involved in supply chain management, for example, uh, may find that instead of flying to go and visit a client, you have a little robot with a 360 degree camera that's uh, walking the lines for you. So all these things are going to change. And then we have uh, the benefits of these, such as the efficiency of supply chain going up something like 16%. BAE, training its first line workers, it made that 40% more efficient by using AI and augmented reality. So all these things are coming in now. So that is uh, going to make a big difference. In the next two or three years, will probably be the biggest change in those things. But there are risks with this because there is a paradox. And the paradox is that you need to have ever higher or ever greater openness and connectivity. And if you have openness and connectivity, then that means there are potential risks. And this is the paradox. Open connected systems using application program interfaces, for example, means that while you want that openness so that the systems, the PACs, the IFE, the in-flight entertainment, the electronic flight bags, the MROs, the OEMs, every person involved in every aspect, design, development, manufacture, maintenance, overhaul, that whole thing uh, requires openness, but openness presents risks. So whichever area you are in the industry, I, I would advocate looking very hard at anything to do with cyber and information security. The risks are quite clear. The risks are quite high. So if we look at operators, they've got to secure things like passenger and staff data. And as an example, BA was recently fined 186 million uh, because their data was hacked. And uh, a lot of passengers lost their personal information. There are plenty of other examples. But if we're starting to bring in-flight entertainment, which is uh, Wi-Fi based onto the aircraft, 
then what are the links between the Wi-Fi systems and the other onboard systems? How are those protected? If you think about your company, or most organizations have a kind of eggshell approach to cybersecurity, the proverbial firewall, and that's just not good enough. But if you think about that in an aircraft system, or an aircraft where you've got many systems, the barriers and the boundaries between those are where your risks are. So cybersecurity and information security in every aspect of what we do is going to become more and more prominent. Um, aircraft have been hacked. A 757 was remotely hacked by Homeland Security to see if it could be done. Uh, and now if Homeland Security, if the good guys can do it, then the bad guys can do it. So if you think about every aspect of what you do, then cybersecurity really needs to be at, at the top of your agenda, I would suggest. And indeed, 85% of CEOs view cybersecurity as a significant risk. I would ask, why not 100%? And the other thing is, only 10% of aerospace companies seem to have adequate protection. And I base that on information I got from various sources, including going to Farnborough Air Show, Paris Air Show, and so on and so forth. And the information I've got from those uh, various organizations is that only 10% of aerospace companies have adequate protection. And indeed, at the Paris Air Show, uh, I went to the cybersecurity uh, conference, or many conferences at these, and it was very sparsely populated, which I thought was significant. So we need to look at this. And of course, clients are looking at this very hard. The US uh, Department of Defense, for example, has brought in CMMC, which is the Cyber Maturity Model Certification. And the draft was released uh, only last month, September 2019. And issue one is due out in 2020. So any uh, request for information or request for uh, proposals in 2020 are going to cite CMMC. So anybody supplying to the US DOD, you need to be on top of CMMC, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. And that will require third-party certification. <coughs> it builds on the existing DFARS 252.204.7012. So that's just the US Defense Organization doing it. The UK has its Defense Industrial Strategy. Australia has its InfoSec Manual. So all these organizations, anybody that's supplying to anybody in defense world, you're going to have to look hard at cybersecurity. Now, growth means jobs. And technology means technically competent people. And digitization is one of those issues. Uh, you need a digital savvy workforce. And of course, we're in a competitive world. There are the, uh, uh, dare I say it, the sexy areas to go and work, such as Google and Facebook and all these things that uh, young people get involved in. How are we going to get them to come into the aerospace world rather than go and work for Google or Facebook? That's a challenge. You need these young people that have grown up with this digital view. Excuse me. <coughs> So there's an issue there on getting the right people. Industry needs to right, recruit the right people, and we are in competition for talent. And then to retain them, keep them, we need to upskill them, develop them, infuse them, and retain them. So again, wherever you are, I would invite you to look at that and decide how you're going to uh, win your share from that uh, talent pool and make sure you get the right ones and retain them. Now this, I apologize for the slide. It's very complex, uh, and it, it's not easy to read. So I would invite you to go and look at the IATA pages. That's who I got it from. Uh, and it just shows the 50 elements that organizations should consider. There's a lot of stuff on there. These are the drivers of change. And about two th a third of the way down, you'll see cybersecurity, where the purple lines are. So there's a lot of factors on there. So whichever, what it, wherever you are in the uh, industry, wherever you are in the supply chain, I would invite you to look at the IATA website. Have a look at this slide. Um, and look at those and put those into your planning. Those of you who are certified to the AS9100 series, you'll know that the standard requires you to consider the organization's context, to consider risks and opportunities. And these factors would be a good place to start when you're looking at that. And of course, from that, you would develop your strategy. So let's look at mobility now. 
And as we said, this is blurring the lines. Now, those of you of my age might remember the Jetsons, uh, the family going around in a little personal uh, jet aircraft. I looked at the introduction quite recently just to pick up on it. It's quite funny. They still have paper money, so they're moving in three dimensions but still have paper money. Anyway, this is where we are. We're blurring the lines. So urban mobility or mobility in the round is becoming the way ahead. And we've got Porsche and Boeing, for example, teaming up together, uh, and they are looking at developing premium personal air taxis. And they plan a first flight of their prototype in 2020. So it's happening now. Aston Martin, uh, the, they are developing a premium uh, personal vehicle, the Aston Martin Volant. Uh, Hyundai, they've hired NASA engineers, and they're working with AI specialists. Uh, Airbus are working with the Vahana. There's Velocopter. Velocopter uh, recently did the first trials of um, working in Singapore. They had a one and a half kilometer flight uh, of the Velocopter around Singapore Harbour. So this is happening now. Uh, these things are going to be going live in 2020. And it's going to start, start in um, certain countries where they can get on top of the regulation. Uh, so you've got Airbus, you've got Terrafugia, Aeromobile, Workhouse, Ehang, uh, Rolls-Royce, not the car part of Rolls-Royce. They're working on propulsion systems because part of this equation is not just the, the, the rotary wing and the, the, the ability to uh, have uh, EV, uh, electrical vertical takeoff and landing. You need to have the propulsion systems. And of course, batteries have a limited range. So Rolls-Royce is working on having a gas turbine powering the batteries to give a 500 mile range at 250 miles an hour. Notice it's in miles per hour knots. So that's an indication of the blurring of lines. But this is happening. This is going to happen faster than we think. So these synergies are going to drive us ahead. So the synergies uh, and the differences. We've got moving in three dimensions, cybersecurity, all vehicles, whether it's um, aircraft or ground vehicles, cybersecurity is becoming an issue. We've all probably heard stories of cars having their steering taken over remotely and so on. Put that into an aircraft situation, an aircraft moving in 3D, perhaps not with a pilot, uh, the cybersecurity of that air vehicle becomes critical. Autonomy, which is probably the future for short haul, but also what about the long haul? There's um, Qantas looking at London to Sydney. And one of the biggest problems they have is crew time. So is autonomy perhaps going to be the solution to that? So the aircraft will be autonomous for part of the time. Who knows? Going back to the urban mobility then, the technical challenges include navigation, detection and collision avoidance, communication, BV loss, which is beyond visual line of sight navigation, power, the batteries, uh, and the power to unit mass and the battery life cycle, uh, autonomy, and then the legal and regulatory challenges. Who's going to be liable for an autonomous vehicle if there's an accident or an incident? All these things have to be discussed. So there's some philosophical things to look at. So we need to develop safe and efficient e-VTOL operations, which requires robust communication uh, and good infrastructure. Uh, and some of the things, the detection, for example, would require things which are probably military environments. So millimetric radar, for example and LIDAR. So there are some challenges in terms of technical limits, but also challenges in terms of sharing technology for uh, commercial use. So it's going to be interesting to see how that pans out. And then the differences with the first one, of course, is regulation. Regulation for cars is very different from the regulation for aerospace. Uh, if we look at management systems, the aerospace quality management system uses the AS9100 series. For automotives, there's IAT F16 have similarities. But the difference between the two is the mindset. To me, that means quite a lot. If you have an aircraft mentality, you think in a different way to somebody who's uh, got a vehicle mentality. And the next difference, of course, is the infrastructure. We need to have airports. How are we going to land these uh, eVTOL aircraft? They may be relatively small. Well, they have to land and take off somewhere. Uh, and of course, in an urban environment, there isn't much ground space. Uh, and then there's things like gate volumes. If you have a, 
an urban mobility port, then it'll be like a taxi rank. So unlike an air airport where you've got people checking in two hours ahead and then they can uh, go through security and all the rest of it, people are going to want to turn up, get on, and go straight away without delays. So the changes are going to be quite significant. But those things are going to happen next year. Singapore, as I say, is where it's all uh, being developed by Volocopter. So it uh, be interesting to see what they come up with and to see how the Porsche and Boeing team come up with a, a new vehicle, which, as I said, they expect to have a prototype next year. Uh, moving on to electrification, there's a race to develop this technology. Um, and we need batteries for all sizes of aircraft. But in the short term, it's going to be the short hop urban mobility side of things. For large aircraft, it's not practical to have battery power. Uh, hybrids may be the way ahead. The largest so far, so far is an aircraft called the Ampere, which was flown in uh, Camarillo in June 2019. But it's only got a range of 100 miles for nine passengers. So that's the biggest hybrid around at the moment. So there's a race for technology. And things like charge rates. Uh, at the moment, charge rates are far too slow. So the only way to deal with that is to swap out battery packs. So then you're looking at ground stations with charging infrastructure as well as the ability to get people in and out. And the cost per kilowatt at the moment is rather too high. So is hybrid the interim solution? Lots of questions there. Uh, but air airlines, as we said earlier on, have to look at the carbon reduction. Uh, and they're looking at carbon neutral growth from 2020 on and cuts of 50% by 2050 based on the 2005 levels. So there are significant drivers for the airlines to engage in this new technology. So I'd expect to see that accelerating. But batteries are the pinch point for that. But there are, of course, opportunities for investment. Um, so uh, with ambitiously short times for getting viable air vehicles, those investments might be uh, ones which give a fairly short return to. Moving on to standards, because I'm conscious of the time. Quick update on standards. Um, standards that can help in the things we've spoken about, cybersecurity, for example, ISO 27001 series, uh, 27701, which is to do with personal security, personal data security. I say 44,001, particularly relevant for collaborative working. No, no company is in Ireland. We spoke just now about Porsche and Boeing and how they're working together. Every organization now has to collaborate um, at the top level, but also with its supply chain. We spoke about pinch points in the supply chain. So using these standards to help, uh, help your business work with its partners, whether they're lateral or peers, or whether up the chain or down the chain, these standards can really help. Looking at the IEQG scheme, the ICOP scheme, which is the AS9100 series of standards, um, there are a few changes coming there. The uh, 9104-1 is the standard which sets out how the scheme runs. And what it's bringing in, amongst other things, is the change to structures. So those of you that are certified to the AS9100 series, if you're a campus, you won't be at the end of next year because campus is going to go and that's because the uh, normative documents, the IAF mandatory documents, don't allow campus structures anymore so the change has got to come. So there are going to be changes to the structures. There will be only two structures, single and multiple, and that will affect audit durations of course. Um, that standard, the 9104-1, should be coming out uh, probably August or so next year with an implementation period of something like 18 months. So look out for that change if you're certified. Similarly, your auditors, the 9104-3, which sets the auditor competence, that is due to come out next year as well. And that will make the, uh, uh, the competence of auditors uh, more robust in that the auditors that don't perform will be removed from the system. It's something which the system has perhaps lacked in the past, is teeth. So uh, the auditor requirements are going to be beefed up and the ability to get rid of auditors will be beefed up and there will be a built-in system for monitoring auditor performance. So any auditor doing third-party audits is going to be monitored against a set of uh, uh, mandatory uh, indicators 
and if they are found wanting then there will be steps taken. Uh, looking at other support standards, 9102 is the first article inspection and 9103 is the variation of management key characteristics. Those are pertinent to most organizations. The one that's really going to start making a difference over the next year or so is APQP, uh, 9145. PPAP has been in the automotive industry over the last few years, but the aerospace industry, particularly the primes, are now becoming much more focused on APQP because they see it as a tool to address a lot of those things we've been speaking about up until now, driving down costs, driving down waste, by planning better, by integrating better. So um, if you're in the supply chain of those primes somewhere, then almost certainly APQP is something you are going to have to look at over the next year. So I would invite you to start looking at that now and start planning for that change. It's in a lot of the contracts. I know Airbus uh, said that it's in, it's in pretty much all their contracts, but they haven't been mandating it until... Uh, now. So they are going to start flowing that down and it's going to go all the way down through the supply chain. So do please look out for APQP. The next slide we've already covered because that's dash one and dash three. So a summary then. We've looked at quite a lot. We've looked at commercial, we've looked at freight, we've looked at politics, we've looked at oil, governments, maintenance, accidents and the fallout, supply chains, manufacturers, MROs, technical issues, industry 4.0 and digitization, AI, uh, we've touched on additive manufacturing, data sharing, cybersecurity, standards, people resource, mobility and electrification. So that's a broad spectrum. Um, I've not gone into the space side of things because um, uh, I had to limit it. There's a lot going on in the space side of things as we all know, but perhaps that's a, a subject for another webinar. I've touched on some of the defense areas. So there are others we, we could have covered, but there are read across from all the things we've looked at today into all those sectors. If we think about people, resource, security of supply chain, cybersecurity, that applies to all of them. So in summary, our industry is strong, it's sound, it's growing, but it faces challenges with energy, environment, noise and pollution, technical risks, operating at the limit of those technical risks and how do we deal with those in-service limitations as we've seen particularly with engines for example, technical challenges and then looking at infrastructure as we look at mobility in the round and particularly urban mobility and how that's going to have a blurring of the boundaries between automotive and aerospace. So there's a lot of opportunities, there are some risks but it's a bright horizon. But throughout these things, safety has to be on top of the list because we are all stakeholders. Thank you. That's all I have to say. I notice we've got a few minutes left. So if there are any questions, then um, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Yep, Brendan, it looks like we have a couple questions here. So our first question is, uh, has the aerospace industry also <coughs> focusing on uh, Virgin Galactica outer space aircraft? Uh, yes, it is. I know that uh, I think Boeing has invested recently in Virgin, so there is certainly a lot of work going on in uh, the aerospace industry looking at all aspects of space. As I say, I didn't really have time to cover that because it's, it's the subject in his own right. But the answer is yes, there are partnerships um, and, uh, uh, and there are uh, things going on in the UK with the, uh, the engine development which is looking at hypersonics uh, and of course hypersonics are coming into, um, dare I say it, weapons and missile systems as well. So yes, there is a lot of industry interest in space because if we look at the mobility picture, we focused on the urban mobility, but if we look at the bigger picture on mobility, um, the higher you go, the further you can go for less energy. So yes, it, the aerospace industry is focusing on space aircraft, not so much outer space, but you know the near space and how we can improve travel uh, around the globe. 
Excellent. And then another one of our attendees was asking what types of changes you're expecting in the AS9100 certification uh, and revision D. Okay, the, the, the 9100 team is only just starting to, to form and start looking at the changes they're going to have to bring in. So there are some um, early discussions about that. Um, I have to confess that at the moment I'm not in a position to, to give you any particular highlights on it. Uh, if, if, if somebody wants to um, contact me directly, then I would be happy to give you some insights. Um, I, I can um, contact the, the writing team and, and see where they're going with things and try and give you some heads up on that. But it is early days, so uh, I can't give you any specifics, I'm afraid. Wonderful. Well, I think that wraps up our questions. Thank you very much, Brendan. This is great information and great insight into the aerospace sector. We also want to thank our attendees for uh, coming to today's webinar. <clears throat> Please complete the survey that will appear after the webinar closes to provide feedback and ideas for future webinars. We appreciate all input. All attendees will also receive a recording to today's webinar in the next 7 to 10 business days. If you'd like to sign up for more BSI webinars, please visit our website at bsiamericas.com backslash events. Thank you very much everyone and goodbye.